This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Annie Coleman in St. Louis, Missouri, in March 2006. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Chapter 23. Well, all day him and the king was hard at it, rigging up a stage and a curtain and a row of candles for footlights, and that night the house was jammed full of men in no time. When the place couldn't hold no more, the duke, he quit tending door, and went around the back way, and come on to the stage and stood up before the curtain and made a little speech, and praised up this tragedy, and said it was the most thrillinest one that ever was. And so he went on a-bragging about the tragedy, and about Edmund Keene the Elder, which was to play the main principal part in it. And at last, when he'd got everybody's expectations up high enough, he rolled up the curtain, and the next minute the king come a-prancing out on all fours, naked, and he was painted all over, rings streaked and striped all sorts of colors, as splendid as a rainbow. And... "'But never mind the rest of his outfit. "'It was just wild. "'But it was awful funny. "'The people most killed themselves laughing. "'And when the king got done caperin' "'and capered off behind the scenes, "'they roared and clapped and stormed and haw-hawed "'till he come back and done it over again. "'And after that they made him do it another time. "'Well, it would make a cow laugh "'to see the shines that old idiot cut.' Then the duke, he lets the curtain down, and bows to the people, and says the great tragedy will be performed only two nights more, on accounts of press and London engagements, where the seats is all sold already for it in Drury Lane. And then he makes them another deep bow, and says if he has succeeded in pleasing them, and instructing them, he will be deeply obliged if they will mention it to their friends, and get them to come and see it. Twenty people sings out, "'What, is it over? Is that all?' The duke says, "'Yes. Then there was a fine time. Everybody sings out, "'Sold!' and rose up mad, and was a-going for that stage and them tragedians. But a big, fine-looking man jumps up on a bench and shouts, "'Hold on! Just a word, gentlemen!' They stop to listen. "'We are sold!' "'Mighty badly sold. "'But we don't want to be the laughing-stock of this whole town, I reckon, "'and never hear the last of this thing as long as we live. "'No, what we want is to go out of here quiet and talk this show up "'and sell the rest of the town. "'Then we'll all be in the same boat. "'Ain't that sensible?' "'You bet it is. The judge is right,' everybody sings out. "'All right, then. Not a word about any sell.' "'Go along home and advise everybody to come and see the tragedy.' "'Next day you couldn't hear nothing around that town "'but about how splendid that show was. "'House was jammed again that night, "'and we sold this crowd the same way. "'When me and the king and the duke got home to the raft, "'we all had a supper, "'and by and by about midnight "'they made Jim and me back her out "'and float her down the middle of the river "'and fetch her in and hide her about two mile below town.' The third night, the house was crammed again, and they weren't newcomers this time, but people that was at the show the other two nights. I stood by the duke at the door, and I see that every man that went in had his pockets bulging or something muffled up under his coat, and I see it weren't no perfumery neither, not by a long sight. I smelt sickly eggs by the barrel and rotten cabbages and such things, and if I know the signs of a dead cat being around, and I bet I do, there was sixty-four of them went in. I shoved in there for a minute, but it was too various for me. I couldn't stand it. Well, when the place couldn't hold no more people, the duke, he give a fellow a quarter and told him to tend door for a minute, and then he started around for the stage door. I, after him, but the minute we turned the corner and was in the dark, he says, Walk fast now, till you get away from the houses, and then shin for the raft like the dickens was after you. I done it, and he done the same. 
we struck the raft at the same time, and in less than two seconds we was glidin' downstream all dark and still, and edgin' towards the middle of the river, nobody sayin' a word. I reckon the poor king was in for a gaudy time of it with the audience, but nothin' of the sort. Pretty soon he crawls out from under the wigwam and says, Well, how'd the old thing pan out this time, Duke? He hadn't been uptown at all. We never showed a light till we was about ten mile below the village. Then we lit up and had a supper, and the king and the duke fairly laughed their bones loose over the way they'd served them people. The duke says, Greenhorns, flatheads, I knew the first house would keep mum and let the rest of the town get roped in, and I knew they'd lay for us the third night and consider it was their turn now. Well, it is their turn, and I'd give something to know how much they'd take for it. I would just like to know how they're putting in their opportunity. They can turn it into a picnic if they want to. They brought plenty provisions. Them reps galleons took in four hundred and sixty five dollars in that three nights. I never see money hauled in by the wagon load like that before. By and by, when they was sleeping and snoring, Jim says, Don't it surprise you the way them kings carries on, Huck? No, I says, it don't. Why don't it, Huck? Well, it don't because it's in the breed. I reckon they're all alike. But, Huck, these kings of iron is regular rapscallions. That's just what they is. They's regular rapscallions. Well, that's what I'm a saying. All kings is mostly rapscallions, as far as I can make out. Is that so? You read about them once, you'll see. Look at Henry the Eighth. This n is a Sunday school superintendent to him. And look at Charles II. And Louis fourteen, and Louis fifteen, and James second, and Edward second, and Richard third, and forty more, besides all them Saxton heptarchies that used to rip around so in old times and raise cane. My, you ought to see old Henry the eighth when he was in bloom. He was a blossom. He used to marry a new wife every day and chop off her head next morning, and he would do it just as indifferent as if he was ordering up eggs. Fetch up Nell Gwynne, he says. They fetch her up. Next morning, chop off her head. And they chop it off. Fetch up Jane Shore, he says, and up she comes. Next morning, chop off her head. And they chop it off. Bring up Fair Rosamond. Fair Rosamond answers the bell. Next morning, chop off her head. And he made every one of them tell him a tale every night. And he kept that up till he had hogged a thousand and one tales that way, and then he put them all in a book and called it Doomsday Book, which was a good name and stated the case. You don't know kings, Jim, but I know them, and this old rip of iron is one of the cleanest I've struck in history. Well, Henry, he takes a notion he wants to get up some trouble with this country. How does he go at it? Give notice? Give a country a show? No. All of a sudden, He heaves all the tea in Boston Harbor overboard and whacks out a declaration of independence and dares them to come on. That was his style. He never gave anybody a chance. He had suspicions of his father, the Duke of Wellington. Well, what did he do? Ask him to show up? No. Drowned him in a butt of mamsey, like a cat. Suppose people left money laying around where he was. What did he do? He collared it. Suppose he contracted to do a thing and you paid him and didn't sit down there and see that he done it? What did he do? He always done the other thing. Suppose he opened his mouth. What then? If he didn't shut it up powerful quick, he'd lose a lie every time. That's a kind of a bug Henry was, and if we'd had him along instead of our kings, he'd have fooled that town a heap worse than ourn done. I don't say that iron is lambs, because they ain't, when you come right down to the cold facts, but they ain't nothing to that old ram anyway. All I say is, kings is kings, and you got to make allowances. Take them all round, they're a mighty ornery lot. It's the way they're raised. 
"'But this one do smell so like de nation, Huck. "'Well, they all do, Jim. "'We can't help the way a king smells. "'History don't tell no way. "'Now, de Duke, he's a tolerable likely man in some ways. "'Yes, the Duke's different, but not very different. "'This one's a middle and hard lot for a Duke. "'When he's drunk, there ain't no nearsighted man could tell him from a king.' Well, anyways, I don't hanker for no more in em, Hook. These is all I can stand. It's the way I feel too, Jim. But we've got them on our hands, and we got to remember what they are and make allowances. Sometimes I wish we could hear of a country that's out of kings. What was the use to tell Jim these weren't real kings and dukes? It wouldn't have done no good, and besides, it was just as I said. You couldn't tell them from the real kind. I went to sleep, and Jim didn't call me when it was my turn. He often done that. When I waked up just at daybreak, he was sitting there with his head down betwixt his knees, moaning and mourning to himself. I didn't take notice nor let on. I knowed what it was about. He was thinking about his wife and his children away up yonder, and he was low and homesick. "'cause he hadn't ever been away from home before in his life, "'and I do believe he cared just as much for his people "'as white folks does for theirn. "'It don't seem natural, but I reckon it's so. "'He was often moaning and mourning that way nights "'when he judged I was asleep, and saying, "'Poor little Elizabeth, poor little Johnny, it's mighty hard. "'I speck I ain't ever going to see you no more, no more.' He was a mighty good nigger, Jim was. But this time I somehow got to talking to him about his wife and young ones, and by and by he says, What makes me feel so bad this time is because I hear something over yonder on de bank like a whack or a slam while ago, and it mind me of the time I treat my little Elizabeth so ornery. She wa'n't only about four year old, and she took the scarlet fever. It had a powerful rough spell, but she got well, and one day she was a standin' round, and I says to her, I says, shut the door. She never done it, just stood there, kind of smiling up at me. It made me mad, and I says again, mighty loud, I says, don't you hear me? Shut the door. She just stood the same way, kind of smiling up. I was a violin, I says, I lay I make you mine. And with that I fetch her a slap side the head to sent her a sprawlin'. Then I went into the other room, and it's gone about ten minutes, and when I come back, there was that door standin' open yet, and that child standin' most right in it, a lookin' down and mournin', and the tears runnin' down. My, but I was mad. I was a gwan for the child, but just then, It was a door that opened innards. Just then, long come de wind and slam it to behind de child. Kerblam! In my land, de child never move. My breath most hop out of me, and I feel so... so... I don't know how I feel. I crope out all a trembling, and crope around and open de door easy and slow, and poke my head in behind de child, soft and still. And all of a sudden I says, pow, just as loud as I could yell. She never budge. Oh, Huck, I bust out a crying and grab her up in my arms and say, oh, de poor little thing. De Lord God Almighty forgive poor old Jim, cause he never going to forgive himself as long as he live. Oh, she was plumb deaf and dumb, Huck, plumb deaf and dumb, and I'd been a treatin' her so.